question, the way that these are done. But um, my name's Sam Parlow. Jenny had some internet problems, so um, I was sent in to open up the room and introduce the session. Uh, so welcome. So this is a ULVLC session. I think we've all been to them before, uh, but the University Library's virtual learning community, ULVC, uh, it was started as a way to promote peer learning, peer learning and build community with the UNCG University Libraries doing, during the COVID-19 pandemic. So since many of us are working remotely, we hope that this project helps everyone in the libraries to learn and share, even while we're working at a social distance. So um, here is the LibGuide again, if we've forgotten, uh, the ULVLC LibGuide. This has a public calendar so you can see what's going up. You will need to sign up for each session. Uh, there is one coming up tomorrow on free screen recording tools. Um, I'm hosting it. Let me look at what time it is. Um, it's at 2, I think. Uh, I will definitely be ready at 2 o'clock tomorrow. Yes, 2 p.m. It's on free screen recording tools. So uh, be sure to sign up for that if you're interested. Today you are in a session with Rachel Olson on um, staying organized in your professional life. So again, I've said it before, and I'm gonna say it one more time. Rachel is definitely the most organized person I have met uh, in, uh, you know, so if you think you can uh, out organize her, definitely let me know. I'll need your advice as well. But um, if you haven't already, please fill out this poll that you see uh, here through poll everywhere. I see people have been filling it out um, and uh, I'm gonna mute myself and Rachel, you can get started. Cool, thank you. Um, so hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, I can see the, the chat as well. So if you uh, have a question, wanna drop it through chat or just unmute yourself, that's fine. This is meant to be pretty informal. Um, I do have some slides, but I'm hoping we can do some discussion based things as well. So thanks to everybody who's participating in the poll. I was mostly just curious about what people are using. So quite a few people mentioning Google, um, <clears throat> a couple people mentioning Trello, which is not something that I had in the slides because I don't use it that often, but I'm certainly happy to show you Trello. Um, and I know that there are folks in the library who use it on a regular basis, I think in Air it, and so um, I'm sure any of those folks would be happy to talk about it as well. Um, so yeah, let's get started. Sorry, I'm working with a dual screen that I'm not super familiar with, but I'm gonna make it work. Next slide. Ooh, okay, so this is entitled Staying Organized in Your Professional Life. And a lot of the things that you see here um, <clears throat> may have some relevance for your personal life as well. So I was just sort of asked to talk about this within the context of some programs that I've helped with, um, some things that I have helped to organize, but certainly plenty of these concepts can help you get organized personally as well. So I'm Rachel Olson. I'm the first year communication and social sciences librarian um, at UNCG. I you all know me, but anyway, um, if you have questions as we go through, like I said, drop them in the chat. This is the link to the slides. Um, I will drop it in the chat right now. Go.uncg.edu slash professional org. You will need to be logged in with your UNCG uh, credentials to see it, but if you're, I'm, I'm someone who likes to have all the links and likes to have all the visuals um, to look at uh, again later, so there you go. And th this recording will be shared. So my goal for you, <clears throat> my goal for myself, um, is to go like somewhere between this, which is, this is a shot from a uh, hoarders, I'm pretty sure or something like it. I just Googled very messy office <laughs> and this. To me, this is like hyper organized, like next level Marie Kondo levels of organization. So I would suggest that if you can land somewhere between here and here, you're going to be in good shape. Um, your goal is to find a system that works best for you and it may be different from what works for me and that's completely fine. I'm not a professional organizer. Um, I'm not trained in organizational techniques or anything like that. I've just over the course of, you know, 10 or so years since I started undergraduate and college um, have found things that just tend to work for me. And if you have different systems, um, if you have something that I don't mention that you'd like to talk about, please feel free. I would love for this to be somewhat discussion based. So um, 
we're not looking for perfection. If you could look around my house right now, or if you've ever been in my office at UNCG, you will know that it's it's a disheveled mess a little bit. Um, but you know, a organization can take many different forms. So organizing events and meetings, this is probably what I have the most experience with. Um, just thinking about logistics, that's sort of the name of the game here. Um, and here's a couple tips. The most important thing is flexibility. Um, you are going to need to be able to adapt on the fly. Something inevitably will go wrong, um, inevitably will happen that you did not expect, especially with a lot of library events when we're working across departments um, and we have lots of sort of different personalities involved. I think that sometimes it's tempting to get maybe a little bit frazzled, maybe a little bit upset when things don't go to plan. Um, so my motto sort of for myself personally and professionally, schedule things in pencil, not in pen. Plan on things going wrong. Um, I'm sorry, my dog has chosen this moment to whine. Um, th schedule things in pencil, not in pen. Be prepared to be flexible. That is the best tip that I can give you. Um, it's not the end of the world. There's no such thing as a library emergency, right? Like it, it will inevitably be okay. As long as nobody gets hurt um, and nothing catches fire, um, I call events successful. So that's the key. So tips and tricks for scheduling events. Um, so start early. As soon as you sort of get wind of you know, an event that you might need to, to help organize, go ahead and start thinking about things, start planning things. And one of the key steps in that, I would say, is to ask for help, even if you think you may not need help. I find that it's way better to have more people ready to jump in and ready to lend a hand than to not ask at all and then, you know, try to have to rally people together at the last minute. Um, <coughs> excuse me, it's better to over communicate than under communicate. It's definitely better to have more people than you actually need. Um, be clear about what you need. Uh, don't, you know, beat around the bush. If someone's job is literally to help move pace like we do with chance, some people's job is literally to move students from point A to point B. Um, and it seems a little silly to them sometimes, but it can be really important. So just being clear like, hey, this is why I'm asking you to do this particular thing here's how it sort of plays into the larger scheme of things. I think being communicative um, is definitely the way to go. And this is something that I'm constantly working on is like following up. Make sure that you uh, don't assume that people know what you're asking and why. Be, be as explicitly clear as you can. Be patient and be polite. This goes back to flexibility a little bit. And this is something that I am constantly working on personally. Um, in those moments where something goes wrong, like you're about to give a presentation and things go haywire with the technology or, you know, someone makes a mistake or, you know, starts the wrong presentation at the wrong time or something. We've got a bunch of patrons in the library, like stay calm. There's no reason to, um, like I said, there's no reason to panic as long as no one's hurt and no one's on fire, like it's going to be okay. Um, deal with the non-human factors first when you're planning. So by this, I mean the things that are like solid or, yeah, Jenny, or if you're supposed to moderate a session and your internet keeps going out, like we make sure that we have colleagues who understand these processes. It's better to have too many people than not enough people. So Sam is really easily able to jump in and help out with this. That's an example. Um, deal with non-human factors first. So set the times and the dates. Try and get things, um, the things that you know are solid, the factors that you know probably aren't going to change. And then thinking about spaces and availability. Um, and there are definitely times where, especially programs like Chance, we've had to think outside the box a little bit. So we have the City Lab, we have the 177A. Um, you can think about SCUA, has Hodges. They also, you know, think about the different spaces that you have to work with. And this doesn't just apply to the library. Um, and think about the availability of those spaces. Who do you need to add? who's the go-to person for that and lock those things down early um, even if <coughs> excuse me with your volunteers even if you don't have specific tasks or times for them if you could just say 
you know, hey, Callie, hey, Darren Lee, I need you to block off, you know, 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. on this particular day, and we'll get to the, the details later. Uh, stuff like that, just letting people know as far in advance as you can is definitely um, going to save you some trouble in the future. And then learning to love your calendar. So I'm one of those people, um, I am a Google Calendar like devotee, I love Google Calendar, been using it for 10 years now. Um, but I also in the past have been the kind of person to use a paper planner as well. Um, maybe, maybe you use both. I don't as much anymore, but I have found in the past that like writing out what you need to do can sometimes help like literally writing it by hand. I know for a lot of people helps you retain the information a little bit better. Um, so it's really about just having some way of knowing where you're supposed to be when you're supposed to be there and I would encourage you to get um, I can recommend a couple calendars and planners that I really love if you're into the into the paper stuff a little bit more I can say with your colleagues um, I know that I personally appreciate when colleagues um, keep their Google calendars up to date because that's what I think a lot of us use um, so try and just keep that you know in mind when you're thinking about stuff like this Make it as easy for people to collaborate with you as possible. Okay, so here's a scenario for you. Uh, 80 high school students are coming to the library for three hours and they need something to do. So <laughs> this is, uh, for anyone who's been involved in Chance, this is the exact scenario that we've dealt with. So some questions that I asked myself um, when planning the Chance session last year, for instance, who might be interested in helping? Like, what is it important for students to learn when they, to walk away having learned when they leave the library? So I'll show you the schedule. Um, it will, it may uh, amaze and astound you. Um, but we, you know, literally wrote out all the departments that we thought would want to interact with students. What spaces are available? We had to get a little creative with this. Um, our library really doesn't have space to hold 80 students in a classroom setting. so. Can we use spaces like um, the DMC, the Ottoman Empire? Can we use things like um, the, we use the, the vending machine area down there on the lower level near the staff lounge? Like you have to get creative sometimes. Um, are there people who would rather not interact with groups um, for a variety of reasons? You know, uh, some departments that aren't public facing uh, might prefer if students stayed away from their office areas, you know, and that's okay. You have to respect people's um, workflows and environments and what they're most comfortable with. Um, are there people who, whose personalities perhaps aren't the best suited to working with this sort of group? So 80 high school students is a highly stressful situation. Um, I will certainly admit that I have in the past um, gotten impatient with some of our younger patrons and it's, it's really hard in that moment to um, kind of hold your tongue a little bit and remain calm. So if there are people that you know um, maybe wouldn't feel comfortable in that sort of situation, ask them to do other things. Ask them to help out behind the scenes or maybe beforehand or after. That's perfectly fine. Um, <clears throat> for instance, when you have large groups coming to the library, how will you make sure that they stay together? Um, well, what are some other factors that come to mind for you all when I present this scenario to you? Like, what else do I need to consider that maybe I haven't written out here? And you can feel free to unmute yourself or type in the chat. Yeah, Jenny, maybe also who has to be involved. So who are the people that like we cannot do this without or who is like the most critical um, the most critical folks for them to interact with. Yeah, absolutely. Callie, what else is going on at the same time? Yes, and that's really important. Um, and we'll talk about calendars a little bit later, but having access to calendars of different rooms to see like, okay, there's gonna be an AAG meeting uh, at this time over here. So maybe I don't wanna bring 80 high schoolers over there. Or maybe I can ask AAG to be flexible with their meeting time, something like that. Um, for sure, what else is going on is important. Um, <laughs> With chance, um, we have to think about um, other camps that are on campus that week. Obviously, that probably won't happen this year, but last semester, music camp happens, um, happened in the same week as 
chance. And so we had to think about um, what other camps are involved. Who else is on campus? What about our students? What about our regular UNCG students? Um, luckily, during the summer, that's not very much something we have to deal with. But when we bring high schoolers into the library during the regular semester, it's definitely something to think about. Marilyn says, who might need to know what's happening even if they are not involved? Yes. And this is something that I personally, um, <clears throat> that's been one of the most sort of difficult lessons for me to learn is uh, who needs to know? You know what I mean? Um, for me, it's like, well, if you're not involved, do you really need to know? But of course you do. Of course it would be valuable for everybody to know that there's going to be 80 kids in the building. So um, sending out a message to Jackson L just saying, hey guys, there's going to be this big event happening at this time be aware and give people a point person to ask questions to for sure anything else on this so you have all these questions you have all these considerations what do you do um so making it easy for people to help you is really important creating plans that are simple and clear or plans that you can um you create the plan, but you can also sit down with people and explain. We have little trainings with people who are going to be helping out with chance. Um, just explaining like, here's what I'm having you do. Here's how it fits into the larger sort of puzzle of what's going to be going on at the time. Here's why it's important. Um, and here's, you know, how you're really helping with this larger event. And then giving people the opportunity to ask questions. Yeah, having things organized enough that you can make it easy for people to step in and help you um, is definitely something that it takes practice um, and you all have worked with me before on programs like this and i'm sure you've seen me struggle with this at certain moments so it's definitely not something that uh, it's easier said than done for sure um so a couple of a couple of examples so this is the schedule from uncg chance from last year. I think it's a masterpiece. It may make your eyes cross. <laughs> um, so what we did was the campers were already in groups. So there are 160 campers total, 80 of them coming to the library at a time. That was one of the factors that we could control is we said to the overall chance planning committee, like, hey, if we can have no more than 80 students in the building at a time, that's going to make this uh, the most feasible for us. So the students were already in numbered groups just for like camp structure. Um, so we took advantage of that and went ahead and just said, okay, uh, we're gonna use those numbers and this is how we're gonna do it. These are groups of 10 students. So 20 people at a time following this schedule. Um, and just being really clear with the chance folks, like here's what's gonna happen, as well as being really clear with the library folks. I think when you have people coming into the library who um, you know, they know that they're there, they know that they're going to be there for a little while, go ahead and give them a copy of what you're doing so that they know what to expect. You know, you don't want to just have them come in blind. I know that's something that people appreciate. Um, <clears throat> so you can see here we had all the different, I started with the times. What times did we have students? And then we took what activities did we want them to do um, during this time slot? And we basically just divided up the time as equally as we could. Now, I know that SCUA and ROI, we always wish that we had more time with students. That's part of that flexibility piece is just, um, you know, and I think we're really good at that in both of those departments, thinking about how to make the most of the instructional time that we have. I'm sorry, Delilah has decided that she needs my attention right now. It's my dog. Um, they also had to make a video uh, during the week that they were here. So we wanted to make sure they had plenty of time for uh, what we call video instruction on that first day, sitting with Armando um, and learning about what they needed to do. So we started with the time and we knew that we had the, <laughs> thank you, as you can hear Delilah snorting in the background. Um, and we knew that we had this group structure already in place. So we just took advantage of that. It gets hairier, watch this, <laughs> when we scroll down, they came back in groups of 80 to the library um, and we had them uh, do some more stuff. And here's where it got a little bit, you know, more difficult to organize. So we needed to have them all have plenty of time to edit their videos, but then also maybe do some other things. Also having time for a break. Don't expect people to go through your event um, with no time to just kind of breathe and, and think. So this schedule, we really relied on many, many people from around the library. Um, so this is just an example of how that gets laid out. 
Um, the library writing group, this is a little bit different. So this is something that um, we started doing this semester. Anyone's welcome to join, by the way, if you're interested, let me know. Um, and we're reading this book, How to Write a Lot by Paul Sylvia. This was a book that I just sort of had in my office and I thought, you know, wouldn't it be neat if we had some sort of writing support group and then we could also go through this book and see like these techniques that this person who has a lot of experience in this area recommends. So I just divided up the book, divided up the semester and said, okay, we're going to have five meetings. How can we work our way through? And then came up with some suggested guided discussion questions, quotes that stuck out to me. I believe Lois is using this same sort of principle with the ULBLC reading group, which you should definitely join. And then sharing this document with people. I would say it's much better to overshare um, than to undershare. You know, feel free to show people your materials. And then the last thing that I'll show you with CST 105, um, I have a lot of CST 105 classes that we handle every semester. They come to the library. I would say this semester we probably had 30 ish, um, and that requires scheduling in advance. Um, so the things that I can control are sort of the dates and times that they come to the library. So putting that together. And then I also have this. Um, students are required to complete an activity as part of their library instruction. And before I had all the links in sort of separate folders by instructor name. But then I realized I have all these people helping with CST 105 instruction, why not put all of this information in one place? Just keep it clean. It's one document, tells you who the instructor is, the date, the time, and then the link to this activity that we're talking about. Um, because they all needed unique links to it. It's a Google spreadsheet I can show you. Um, and we'll get into why Google is so great for this sort of stuff. So this is the activity. So it makes it easier for the librarian who is going to be teaching that session because like, for instance, Sam helps out a lot with these. She could say, okay, yeah, I know I'm teaching Riley's class, this date, this time, boom, there's the link. So just keeping it clean, keeping it simple. People shouldn't need 10 and 20 different links um, to do what you're asking them to do. So I also do some work with the Carolina Bassett Home Rescue um, scheduling transports. So I'd be happy to talk about that maybe in the Q&A time, but that's another sort of logistical puzzle. Um, so I called this one turning, we should do that into we're doing it. So I would say even if you're not in charge of an event or meeting, you can still help facilitate. You can still help with scheduling and documentation. So um, I do this a lot in ROI. Um, I'm very often not in charge of the particular thing that we're talking about, but I know that I have this, um, this skill set of being organized and kind of helping, um, you know, thinking about when we say we should really think about doing that in the future. I'm like, okay, then let's do it. Let's create a calendar event. I'm, uh, we always, you know, kind of joke around and say my answer for everything is let's open a Google Doc. Like, just start somewhere. Um, and I think that, you know, being someone who can help um, not motivate people, but kind of just take those first couple steps um, is, is an important thing and it's essential part of the process. So even if you're not like the leader or the boss, you can still um, do your part. And if you know that you're a good note taker, if you know that you're a very organized person, this could be a moment where you really step in and help your department. Are there questions so far? Anybody? Having some trouble here. Okay. Um, don't take it personally if people have questions or if they have feedback. This is um, one of the things that I have struggled with the most and I'm sort of learning more about all the time. Be patient with people um, and they'll be patient with you in return. So if people have questions, if people have suggestions, um, learn to sort of accept those. Even if you don't end up using the feedback that they that they gave, be gracious and be you know considerate enough of this person helped you out with this particular event, this person took the time um, to, you know, think critically about what happened. So, you know, use it as an opportunity for growth. Don't be offended. It's really all about teamwork. Um, I think that, you know, if this person over here is the one handling all the logistics, that's great. It can't happen, excuse me, it can't happen without all these other people. So you are not an army of one, I promise. And you've got to learn. I know for me, um, I have had to learn over time, like you may be the logistical person behind all this stuff. 
you can't pull it off alone. So um, this is not the end of my presentation. I realize that may be misleading. Um, be sure to thank the people that help you. Um, be sure to say, you know, hey, I really appreciated you um, stepping in and doing this. And I really think that, you know, I, I value your contributions, like letting people know that they're appreciated, um, even if things didn't go perfectly, even if they didn't go as planned, um, being able to be collegial in that way, I think will make people possibly want to help you again in the future. So now this is the more sort of technical side of things. I sort of talked a lot about you know, some just suggestions, but here's some tools that you can use. Um, and I will say that I use mostly digital tools, but when I'm actually working at the office, um, I have a whole folder system that I use for, um, <coughs> excuse me, organizing different aspects of my job, thinking about juggling liaison areas. So um, I'm not at all saying that digital organization is the only way or the best way. These are just some suggestions. So I'm a Google person. I know that a lot of people in that poll at the beginning indicated some Google things that they like to use to keep themselves organized. So I'm gonna talk just briefly about some of those things um, and some things that you may wanna consider. I'm, I consider myself a Google Power user. I'm certainly not an expert though. So if you have suggestions, things you wanna add in as we go through this, please feel free by all means. This is sort of just a crash course or kind of a peek at how I do it. So this is my calendar um, from a particularly busy week back in February. Um, <clears throat> you'll notice that I schedule an hour for lunch every day when I can. Um, it's really important to take that time for yourself. Um, be sure to block that out if you have a schedule like I do where people can book appointments with you like students. Um, being sure that you've saved some time for yourself every day is really important. Um, you will notice classes, things like that are listed here. I also have stuff um, like if I need to take an hour to work on something. So I took a legal materials class. I blocked off time to do that. Um, if you need to, there's another sort of blank for it. If you need to prep for something, don't just list it out. Don't just say, uh, I need to do that somewhere. Put it on your calendar. That can really help you kind of motivate and do the thing um, saying, yeah, I don't want to just, you know, think about doing my legal materials course stuff. Here's the time that I'm actually going to do it and be, you know, defend that time on your schedule. Try not to um, try not to remove it if you can help it. Multiple Google calendars are great. Um, if you are someone who if you feel comfortable sort of with this level of scheduling, another thing you might want to consider is um, doing different calendars. I know an ROI, so this orange, that is 177A, the purple is the City Lab. And this is really critical for us with how we schedule things in the department, making sure that it's clear who gets to use the room at which time. Um, you can also, um, this calendar here that's sort of in you can see my dogs need Brevecto and Heartworm. Um, you can see the sort of reddish calendar here. That's that library conferences and events calendar. So you can leave them turned on um, or you can turn them off as you want to. But if you have things, um, multiple space considerations that you need to make, go ahead and overlay them. Um, one of my favorite features of Google Calendar, and this is something they've added recently, um, is this find a time feature. So let me show you. When you actually go into Google Calendar, if I want to create an event, schedule a meeting, I'm going to create, talk about Tiger King, okay? It's going to give you a sort of default time slot. You can sort of ignore that for now. I'm going to click more options. And if you click this find a time tab, as you add people on the right, so I know Amy has watched Dr. King, Megan has watched it, okay. Um, you can see when those folks are available. You can see, okay, so the orange is Amy, uh, the purple's Megan, the green's me. And I could then select like, okay, this looks like a time that we all might be able to talk. And then from there, you can go to your event details and you can add your location can add conferencing if you need to be virtually. Um, lots of different options here. I also love that you can attach, if you click add attachment, you can upload it from your computer. You can also grab things from your Google Drive. Uh, for instance, if I wanted to put in, I don't know, spreadsheet about collections, okay? And then event description, Carol did it. 
save. It's going to send invitations to your guests. So, uh, and blah, 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 invite. So Amy and Megan, you're going to get some invites about Tiger King. Um, so that's one feature that I really like. Again, overlaying these calendars. Okay. A lot of library conferences and events have been canceled, so that's why you're not seeing as many, uh, but they were pretty, uh, yeah, so you can see stuff like that. I will also um, sometimes, like with the reference desk, we rely on Google Calendar a lot, so I could overlay like, okay, I need to take a shift at this time, am I available to grab that? So anyway, maybe review for some of you, maybe brand new for some people. So that's a really helpful tool, um, especially when you have to schedule like large groups of people, being able to see um, <clears throat> when folks are available and you can look several weeks out. So um, switching gears a little bit. Um, so you have within Google Drive, you have shared drives, which used to be called team drives. And then you have your own personal drive. And I feel like people have some pretty strong feelings on this. Um, and hang on just one second. Um, so people have some pretty strong feelings about shared drives versus regular. So if you click shared drives, you can see all these different ones that I'm a part of. Um, there are definitely some pros and cons to that. So when you want to think about doing a shared drive, um, the sharing privileges are a little bit different in terms of who owns the files or folders. Hang on one second, guys. Um, thinking about who has sharing, I'm sorry, the other dogs are being challenging. Um, thinking about who can move files, moving folders, sharing privileges. Personally, I prefer just to keep things in my drive rather than using a shared drive because things like this can happen. So this is something we're dealing with right now with the community engagement um, group, whose formal name I cannot remember, but I'm part of this group. This is a screenshot from our shared drive. Um, Kay Gorman, Keith Gorman, is the manager. He um, has administrative control over all the content, which has a lot of implications in terms of sharing um, and, and editing. Um, as you may know, Kay Gorman is no longer at UNCG. Um, <clears throat> so that presents a little bit of an issue. So in our last meeting, we were talking about, do we need to contact Keith? Do we need to ask him to share this? But your UNCG email doesn't last forever, right? So does he even still have access? Um, I don't know what ultimately happened with this, but that's definitely a downside of shared drives. Um, also, when you think about the structure um, in terms of who can see what, how it appears, um, different things. So I'm not a shared drive downer, uh, it's just a personal preference. By the way, this graphic comes from the University of Michigan's ID, IT department. And I just wanted to show that larger page. Um, it's a really nice breakdown of some things related to shared drives versus regular drive. Um, luckily, there's a lot of really great information on Google and sort of some of the subtleties of these tools out there. Um, so I'd encourage you to check those out. Okay, if you need help with Google, again, you have access to all these slides. Support.google.com actually has some pretty good stuff. Um, I think they do a relatively good job of making it uh, so that you can get help with different issues. And, you know, if you have questions, things like that. Um, I don't know how it works in terms of like their live support, like if you need to talk to a person, but they have lots of different things covered here. Um, so definitely feel free to take advantage of that. I think there's something like 30 different Google apps. If you click here, like there's a ton of them. So um, some you'll use more than others, but they're all potential tools for getting organized. So uh, what other strategies do you use for getting organized? I want to open it up a little sort of discussion. Um, while people are typing or thinking about that, I will show you Trello, which is a tool that some folks talked about. If you're not familiar with Trello, I know that Brown uh, is really, really good with Trello. No clue what that's about. Um, when we created library tutorials, for instance. This is the board that we used. Um, and we have all these different labels for how things are organized. So for instance, um, who's going to create it? 
Uh, if you look at labels, we have, is it done? Is it still being written? Is it considered like a core, really important one? Is it advanced or basic? Where are we in the process? So that's one way you can use Trello. Sorry, Sam, I didn't ask before I used that board. Um, this is one, I don't really use Trello that much, um, but sort of a couple semesters ago, I was thinking about some of this stuff um, and attempting to organize it this way. And then I think another part of being organized is done. Like thinking about what have you accomplished, make it easily visible, save things that are um, nice when people give you a pat on the back for this great organizational work you're gonna be doing. I have a whole um, folder in my email called kudos and nice things and you can see i'm going really off plan here um but i'll show you color-coded labels within your email for different things so for instance like like political science i'm the political science librarian i keep all of that stuff organized in this way come on computers being slow. But you can see that every sort of different subject has its own color, has its own tab. And I really try to keep things, try to keep things, I'll talk about Trello a little more, and um, I try to keep my, this is a lot of unread emails for me. Um, and this is a lot of e emails to not be in different folders. So like I said, uh, I'm certainly not an expert. And these are all things that I, you know, work on at different times, but try to keep your inbox clean. Um, really, really, it can help you a lot. So um, 16 is a whole lot of unread for me. Yes, like it stresses me out. Um, so and with Trello, um, you just go to Trello.com. I'll drop that in here. Um, and it will prompt you. I believe you can log in or create an account using your UNCG Google address. So if I log out, log back in, yeah, so you can connect it. I actually had one back when I was at Guilford, but now I click log in with Google. You can choose, boom, and there it is. And it's, it's nice if you're a visual person, if you're someone who likes to sort of organize things that way, um, you can click and drag a lot of things. You can, you know, create, I like Trello for the sharing. With a project like Library Tutorials, it's, it's pretty perfect. Um, you can assign different cards to people. Um, again, Brown is really good at Trello. So I don't want to volunteer him to do a ULVLC session on it, but maybe he would. Um, are there other questions? So Michael Reeder says, we use Trello and Eric not just for individual projects, but also projects we will all be working on. When we re-image all public machines every summer, each machine has a card in Trello. And as we complete steps, we mark them off. So if I have to leave abruptly, Marcus can step in and know exactly where in the process I was. No, I think that's great. That's Trello is, um, Trello is great for teamwork. I find it to be more useful for that than for individual things. And then Darren Lee says, email labels are great, just have to keep up with it. Absolutely. Email filters that will give received emails. Yeah, that, so that's really cool. I haven't set any of those up, but you can actually set it in, uh, for instance, Gmail, so that if you get an email from a particular person or from a particular, um, or I think that even mentions a particular word or something like that, you can have it go into a certain folder. Um, you can also do things with Gmail. They have tabs. Um, yeah, filters for listservs are great. Um, if you're a Parks and Rec fan, they had a Jerry filter, which is where these people set up so that all the emails from this one particular person went to a folder that they never checked. So you could do it like that. Um, yeah, lots of different things that you could do there, for sure. There are tons of Gmail features that we didn't even touch on. Um, so, yeah. And this is um, um, the thing I like also about Trello is that um, like it can work well with how your brain works. Like the way I set it up in Trello might be different than other people. Um, yeah, with like what Rachel was talking about with all the stuff, right? Like Google Sheets, Google Docs, your calendar. Like it really just kind of depends on your brain, but also mm -hmm. easier for other people. Yeah, I think there's probably a like a tech platform or maybe even a Google app for um, for everybody out there that would work in different ways for for everyone. I'm much more like uh, I'm not very what's the one where you're not very creative. It's is it left brained. Um, I think I think in that way a lot. I think in a very like sort of 
logistical, just write everything down sort of way. I'm not very visual. Um, so I think there are lots of apps out there that can kind of accommodate both of those styles for sure. Anybody else? Rocket book would be good if you like to write it down because then you can scan it and it will send it to either your Trello board or just your email or whatever and it'll um, read the text for you and make it into text. That's cool. Email. It's awesome. Yeah. Um, on the right, you'll notice in Google these days, they've got things like Google Keep, which I don't really use, um, but some people love Google Keep uh, for notes. You can do tasks. Um, I did experiment with this for a little while. Um, you can also, yeah, put things in Google Calendar. Using Google to keep Google Keep for recipes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there are lots of things here that can certainly translate into like that personal sort of arena for sure. Um, I know I share my, uh, my Google work calendar with my husband, whenever I'm working late, I actually make an event, um, and you know, invite him to it. So it's like very clear working till whatever this day. So yeah. Other things, there is one more thing that I'd like to talk about, but I think we have a good amount of time. So Anybody else? And we can open it back up here in a few minutes. Um, one thing that I want to be sure to mention, um, if you're into this kind of stuff, if you're into project management, if you're into sort of thinking about leadership opportunities, um, the NCLA Leadership Institute is accepting applications now um, until April 30th, you can apply. And I know, can people just use the um, like raise hand feature? Uh, I think you should all be able to see that if you've participated in Leadership Institute. Sam has not. Darren Lee has not. Yeah, do yes or no, I guess, if that's what you're seeing. I know Amy has. Yeah. Um, so a couple people. Lots of folks in the library are involved. I know Mike um, is has run it um, for quite a while. Um, it is a really great opportunity. It's basically like a four day um, immersive sort of workshop related to things related specifically to library leadership. Um, and you don't need to be someone who is a department head or a supervisor in order to do this. It's really helpful for me um, because it was a way to think about how to sort of lead without that title. You know what I mean? How ways that you can become a leader without having to um, be in charge per se. Um, also, if you're interested in management, if you're interested in, in, you know, supervisory sort of things like that, it's a great opportunity. Project management um, is something that they cover really extensively here. So I'll drop the link to this um, in the chat, it's also in the slides, um, but we've got some testimonials from past participants. Um, we've also got, there's a couple people who are academic librarians um, who participated in, uh, like Megan was in my cohort, Jennifer was there, a um, couple people. These are just like samples of folks who have participated in the past. So if you are interested, I would highly recommend that you apply. I would be happy to write references for anybody here. Um, it's something that, you know, Think you should consider. So, and you'll get more tips on organization, things like that, at the Leadership Institute. Other questions? Other things? Okay, cool. Well, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. But you have the link to the slides. So yeah, someone else should talk now so that I know okay. we're talking so about. So you're getting very great feedback in the chat. And I'm going to stop recording so that um, y'all could uh, talk to each other if you like.